Welcome, everyone, to another Bible study from the Lifeway Curriculum, Explore the Bible. This is session number six, and the title is, But Whoever Drinks. It comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 11 through 26. And you know, we're all thirsty for something, and the advertisers uh, use the media to play to that thirst. Uh, They often promise that their products will give us whatever it is that we're missing. And then the social media feeds our thirst as well, knowing what will cause us to just keep on scrolling through the endless feeds. And you know, people throughout history have had that same kind of thirst. We're looking for something that will quench that thirst, something that will satisfy us deep within in our innermost being. And today we're going to study a, um, an encounter between the living Jesus Christ and a Samaritan woman who'd come out to draw some water at a well, and uh, she found something that satisfied her thirst. She may not have been able to identify the thirst, but she surely experienced it, and when she had this encounter with Jesus, he satisfied her thirst for what was truly, truly important. But before we proceed... Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you that you know us intimately and that you do have exactly what we all need, even though we may not know that you are who we need. We need the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as our Savior, as our Lord, as our King. We need your Spirit within us. We need the life that only you can provide. And I pray that as we study this passage in John chapter 4, we'll come to understand that. Dear Lord, I pray that you will open our spiritual eyes and enhance our spiritual understanding so we can really grasp what's being said here. We're going to look at some natural things and try to make application to the spirit realm. I pray that you'll teach us all. Help us to understand, and uh, more importantly, help us to receive this living water. Help us to receive your life within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we look at this passage in the Gospel of John chapter 4, uh, Jesus is, is um, he didn't travel, uh, he didn't actually have to travel on this road that he was traveling on. Many Jews would cross to the east side of the Jordan River instead of actually going through Samaria, and in that way they avoided contact with the Samaritans whom they actually despised, and they wanted to avoid them whenever possible. Well, Jesus himself had a different agenda. He had a divine appointment with a woman who certainly did not expect her life to change that day, and because of her Jesus deliberately traveled through uh, the Samaritan town of Sychar. Sychar is identified with Shechem. It was the original capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, Jacob had built a well there in that land. And this well uh, where they meet is the well built by Jacob. And Jesus was somewhat weary from his journey, but he was not too tired to fulfill his true purpose, his messianic purpose, he's come to seek and to save people who are lost. And that's in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Well, around noon, he's at the well, and he's waiting while his disciples have gone into town to to buy food. And this Samaritan woman comes out in probably the heat of the day to um, draw water from the well. She's she's alone, and Jesus is alone, and... and, um, She's probably somewhat wary of this uh, Jewish man there. And when Jesus spoke to her, he broke several customs that really surprised her. Men in that day did not speak to unaccompanied women, and Jews did not speak with Samaritans, and Jewish strangers certainly did not ask for help from a Samaritan woman. And uh, we're going to Later on in the passage, we'll discover that her past was uh, maybe somewhat sketchy. 
and uh, the encounter is a little even, even a little more odd due to that. And uh, the thinking of people is not going to inhibit Jesus in any way whatsoever. He's going there to see this lady, and he's reaching out to her. Uh, his uh, encounter with her at the well, and then her response to him, and then um, her witness to the townspeople where she lives is going to bring them out to meet Jesus for themselves. They're going to come to know him, and uh, they're going to begin by following uh, by, by following her out to meet Jesus, and then they're going to meet Jesus for themselves. Well, the idea here, Jesus wants to seek and to save the lost, whoever they may be, wherever they may be, all people in every nation, every uh, tribe and every tongue and every nation. He's reaching out to people everywhere. And you and I who know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we should reach out to everyone. Uh, don't decide in advance that someone can't be saved or or God's not interested in them. That's never going to be the case. He loves, he loves, he loves people. And he longs for them to have eternal life. And uh, this is eternal life is going to be described or symbolic, symbolized as living water. Water, uh, of course, flows in, in some form, uh, a stream or a river. And uh, it, it, nourish, it um, quenches our thirst and nourishes our bodies. And in a way, we must have water to, to continue our life. Well, in order to continue eternal life, we'll have to have Jesus as the source of our life. So just as you would drink water to satisfy your physical thirst, in order to satisfy your spiritual thirst, uh, your spiritual necessity, you must have Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, and through faith in Jesus Christ, literally receiving him, receiving the life of Christ himself into yourself, he will quench that thirst and you'll find uh, that you now have eternal life and an abundant life. There'll be a lot to learn, but you have the life that uh, you've always longed for, but may not have understood what it is you're longing for or how to get it or what to look for where to look for it. Um, it's a little bit mysterious in a sense, but the Gospels are for us to get to know who Jesus is. John here is explicitly written. Uh, it's like a fast-moving account of the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's primarily about his earthly ministry, and uh, he wants you to see what Jesus has done, his, uh, just a sampling of seven miracles that Jesus has performed. And then he wants you to recognize the fact that no one but God could do this, the miracles he performed. He calls them signs, and the signs point to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, uh, the Christ, the Anointed One, the One and Only who can bring you and I eternal life, the one and only who can pay the penalty in full for our sins. This is Jesus, and John is introducing us to him. Well, John in chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, he makes a statement there, I've written these things so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then he states, by believing you may have life in his name. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. Read that carefully and think about it. The point is life eternal is available to whosoever will really and truly believe in Jesus Christ. Those who believe receive eternal life. Those who reject or refuse to believe do not receive eternal life. This is uh, the most important book, I think uh, the, the Bible is the book concerning what happens after you die physically. What happens? And it's uh, something we all are faced with. And so it's imperative that we understand the truth concerning that. Eternity 
is a long time to think about what we should have done. I saw that on a church sign somewhere once, and it's never, uh, it's, it's, I've never forgotten that. It's such an important thing. Eternity is a long time to think about what we should have done. Well, I thank you for joining me in this study, and I pray that you'll uh, subscribe to this channel and, and uh, p- post some likes there if you enjoy this and uh, uh, make comments, but uh, share these episodes with people, and, and thank you for uh, your participation in these. So now let's get into the study. Um, let me go over here back to the PowerPoint a little bit here. There's our title slide, but whoever drinks... It's um, available, this life of Christ is available to all, but it's only those who drink or those who uh, consume it, uh, take it in, uh, so to speak. All right. When, uh, if you were really, really thirsty and you came across a stream of water, uh, there it is for the taking but it won't satisfy your thirst until you actually drink the water. And this is just a beautiful scene somewhere, but uh, we're going to see rivers of living water uh, in this passage. And uh, the key doctrine, of course, that we're studying is God the Son. That's a little different than saying the Son of God. This is God the Son, and God the Son now dwells in all believers as the living and ever-present Lord. This comes from Colossians 1, verse 27, and then 1 John chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. But the idea is uh, just as you would drink a glass of water and it would satisfy your thirst, this uh, life of Christ that's being offered to us is to be taken in. We do that by faith in Jesus Christ as we listen to his words and believe his words or listen to the words of John in the gospel or Matthew, Mark, or Luke, all the, all the gospels. As we listen to these words and believe, take them to heart, really and truly believe, they have a profound effect on us. They can bring us eternal life. And it's because Jesus would uh, himself is conveyed to us through these words. His words are spirit. His words are life. Uh, in the uh, beginning there, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there's, um, honestly, when I read these passages, I uh, don't fully understand exactly how this works. But when you read the words of of Jesus Christ, or you read the Gospel of John, the words that were given to John by way of the Holy Spirit, when you read those, they have an effect on your spirit. Uh, When they're coupled with belief or faith, uh, receiving Christ, uh, there's many ways of of stating this, you become born again or born from above. And as a spiritual birth occurs, the... um, Spirit is now, your spirit is now indwelt by the Spirit of God, making you alive eternally. First, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 24, uh, and many other passages. This is the conveyance of life, the life of God Himself to thirsty people, people who are willing to receive. They want this gift of eternal life. They want the giver. We want to. Uh, that's uh, my deepest heart's desire is to have Jesus Christ. I want to know him, uh, love him, understand him, everything, uh, be rightly related to him, uh, adore him. He's awesome. And uh, the, the idea here, he's willing to be your savior, your friend, your Lord, your king, everything. He's making himself available, and it's uh, through These words we find in Scripture, Uh, preaching and teaching will convey these things, but if you listen with an honest, open heart, it'll have a profound effect on you, and it's, it's an eternal effect. 
So listen carefully uh, to the gospel. You know, I would um, strongly recommend that everyone sit down with uh, the Gospel of John, just that one book. Uh, it's about 21 chapters. It may take an hour and a half or two hours to read the entire book. Depending, <laughs> um, uh, You're going to be exposed to some things that are just mind-boggling uh, concerning who Jesus is, concerning the signs he performed, the miracles he performed, uh, the people's interactions with him. Some, some despised him and wanted him dead. Others... Uh, basically worshipped him and honored him uh, in the deepest manner possible. Some knew him not, some received him not, and to those who received him, however, he gave them the right to become children of God. John chapter 1, verses 10, 11, and 12. So think carefully about the Lord Jesus Christ and and the message of John, uh, the gospel of John here, that message. Think carefully about what's being said because There isn't anything more important that you'll ever uh, consider. Christ Jesus uh, is eternal life to those who receive him. So this this, uh, key doctrine, God the Son, God the Son now dwells in all believers, everyone who's received him by faith, as the living and ever-present Lord. Now this is a... an interesting concept, like how I used to think, well, I'm in here, this, I'm in this body, this is me, there's not room for anyone else, but God is spirit, and uh, it's in the realm of the spirit that he inhabits us. Um, his spirit is able to uh, indwell us, and uh, we receive him uh of our own will, we we receive him, and he grants a new birth to us. He opens our spiritual eyes and our spiritual understanding, just like these eyes can't see God. I can't see God with these eyes, and I can't hear him with these ears, but he can equip me with spiritual senses. He can open my uh, spirit to the things of God. And he's more than willing to do so. And the gospel here, the, the words he's given us in Scripture, are the means to accomplish that. So as you read the Bible, you think carefully about what it says, it, it's able to transform you. And that's what happened to me. One and one half trips through the gospel of John, and I became a new creature. I was born again. I now have eternal life right now, real-time possession, and uh, as one who's been blessed by the grace of God, uh, Christ was gracious to me, I want to share this with the whole world. I want everybody to have Christ Jesus, and I can't help anyone. Your church can't help anyone, but Jesus Christ can. Churches and people like me are pointing people to Jesus. Don't, Don't confuse works or good deeds for eternal life. It is Jesus Christ, the Lord, who is life. He himself must indwell each and every believer. And uh, as this key doctrine states, God the Son now dwells in all believers as the living and ever-present Lord. So here we go. All right. Um, as we summarize, basically, this is uh, the lesson here. I uh, I heard some speaker somewhere a long time ago. He said, he said, uh, tell them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, <laughs> and after you finish, tell them what you told them. So <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good way to state it. This uh, summarizes our lesson right here in the beginning. Jesus provides eternal satisfaction for all who trust in him. People find lasting spiritual satisfaction only in Jesus. Okay? Then admitting our sin is the first step towards salvation. There's something that happens as you 
learn about Jesus, you'll begin to have a an awareness of your own standing with him, your own sinfulness, and then admitting our sin is the first step towards salvation. Then thirdly, believers must worship God in spirit and truth from the heart according to the scriptures. God, uh, worship God in spirit means from your own heart. It, it has really nothing to do with your physical location. It has everything to do with your, uh, for lack of a better word, your attitude towards the Lord. You come to him humbly and in repentance from sin, and then you acknowledge the truth there concerning his identity, his deity, his uh, uh, kingship. He is the king, and you come to him acknowledging who he is, and you also acknowledge your your own sinfulness. You're willing to admit you're a sinner. You approach Jesus and you worship him honestly, I guess would be the best way to explain it, as honestly as you know how. Present yourself to him as you are. Don't pretend to be better than you are. Or don't pretend you're not a sinner. Come to him and, and just confess the full truth. And then believers... You must really and truly believe Jesus is the Son of God. Well, true believers will find eternal satisfaction through faith in the promised Messiah. You know, I looked for satisfaction in a new boat or a new car or uh, uh, money or something to that effect, something pleasurable. I looked for some deep, peace in my heart through possessions. Could never find it. I could get new possessions. What I was really searching for was beyond uh, the reach that I had. And I didn't satisfy that true longing. It was a quest for something. I didn't know what it was I was even looking for. But uh, when I read the Gospel of John, and John introduced me to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit revealed Jesus to me through the Gospels there through the account John wrote, then I knew Jesus is the one that can satisfy this inner thirst, this longing that I had, and I received him that day. I I didn't actually, <laughs> on the day that I received him, I surely would not have been able to explain all of that, but 24 years later, in retrospect, I can see he has entered into me, he's come into my life, he's changed me, and he's continuing to change me. We call that sanctification. He's working on us. But if you'll pay careful attention to Jesus himself and look to him as the one and only who can save you, uh, understand how much he loves you, he's paid the penalty for your sins, understand he, he wants to give you this life, if you're willing then you can see him in action today here in this John chapter 4. He's going to literally encounter this woman who has a, a sketchy past. And he, uh, at the end of the story, she's received Christ and then gone out to lead her town to him. So you can see the, the uh, uh, reasoning in Jesus' visit here. He wants this, this uh, lady to have the peace with God that she so so desires she doesn't even know what she needs that's that's a fascinating thing to me but we don't often all we don't always know what we need but Jesus does so there's that passage there and in uh, John chapter 4 verse 11 through 15 I'm going to go back and read just a few verses uh, before we start here just to kind of Set the stage for the context. Uh, and this is King James here. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized uh, more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Uh, that's an essential uh, statement, he must needs go through Samaria. Well, it wasn't the route, it was this encounter. 
It's a divine encounter. He's going there to meet this particular person, and through her witness, the entire town's going to come out and meet him. He must needs go through Samaria. <clears throat> then he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Jesus was absolutely human, fully, fully human, just like you and I, and he was fully and completely God. Well, here, his humanity is on, on display. He's, uh, uh, he was wearied with his journey, and apparently he's thirsty because he's about to ask her for a drink. <clears throat> there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Now, from what I can understand, the Samaritans and the Jews really did not get along. They didn't like each other. There was uh, many reasons that go back in history. The religion of the Samaritans, they limited themselves to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, whereas the Jews had the full canon, the all, all 39 books of the Old Testament, from uh, Genesis all the way through Malachi, the prophets and, the, and the, the historical books. They had all of that, all 39 books. But the Samaritans were limited to five books, and then they had written essentially some of their own scriptures. It was a syncretistic mix of things. They had some knowledge, uh, some background knowledge. They knew there was a Messiah that was coming. But as far as uh, many other details, they, they were missing a great deal. So the Jews looked down on the Samaritans, and uh, there were many factors involved. But suffice it to say, they really didn't get along. Well, so when, when Jesus asks this woman for a drink, um, then said the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that you being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. That's a pretty clear way to put it. They didn't have any dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that said to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Well, there's the stage set now for what we're about to study. Uh, he has thrown something out there. He's, he's uh, spoken a term, he would have given you living water. Now, I'm sure this Samaritan lady doesn't grasp initially what he's saying. Uh, a lot of things that Jesus says and does, you may not pick up what he's saying with the first time you hear it. Sometimes it requires some meditation, maybe a little biblical research to go back into the Old Testament and see if there's something symbolic back there uh, that you can draw from. Water is often described, uh, uh, I'm sorry, water is often a type of the spirit. Uh, sometimes the wind is a type of the spirit, but the, the water or the wind uh, or the breath, these are all types of the spirit, or they can symbolize life. They can symbolize the Holy Spirit, but there's lots of typology in the scripture that um, uh, God uses to describe things that we we couldn't understand uh, without some something to say this is like that. And uh, he's going to start just by describing something. This stream of life that she's being offered is, is described as living water. If you could drink some water that would keep you alive eternally, <laughs> that's basically what he's offering. Well, as the conversation begins here, Sir, said the woman, this is John chapter 4, verse 11, <clears throat> you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? 
he gave us the well and drank from it, as did his sons and uh, livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. So he's, he's using the term water, then he uses a well of water, and then he says it springs up in him for eternal life. Jesus is describing the process by which you and I may live forever. You might miss that if you get uh, uh, too concerned about the typology. What he is literally offering her is the very same life that's his and his alone to give. He's willing to share his life with us. And he's describing it in a manner hopefully she'll be able to follow and understand. And uh, believe me, uh, it's taken me a long time. I'm still learning. But in, um, in verse 15, Sir, the woman said, Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. <laughs> All right. Well, she's... Uh, She's not fully cognizant of what he's offering to her because she's still going to go back to this well or possibly not go back to this well for water. So she's not made the connection between the spiritual truths he's about to reveal to her. But he has come to Samaria uh, on his way from Judea to Galilee, and uh, he's made this special trip just to meet her. And uh, the term living water... Uh, often she probably is thinking about flowing water like river in a stream. Um, she also notes Jesus doesn't have a bucket to draw water from the well. And uh, he's going to explain to her that this water would be springing up in him. This is something that he possesses. It's inside him or uh, one of the clearest explanations of this is in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. It, it speaks of the second Adam becoming a life-giving spirit. Jesus, once resurrected and ascend, ascended back to heaven, has now become a life-giving spirit. He is the second Adam and the life-giving spirit. So you may have to think about that for a few minutes. The, the source of life, a life-giving spirit, uh, he's offering his spirit to indwell your spirit, making you alive eternally. He's offering much, much more than just physical thirst satisfaction. He's not just going to relieve her physical thirst. He's offering to satisfy her thirst at a spiritual level, the deepest of all levels. This is what we all need. We all desperately need the spirit of Christ Jesus indwelling us. In that way and that way only, we can be eternally filled with joy, uh, love, uh, peace. Uh, we'll be satisfied finally. Uh, everything that we, we could ever ask for is in Jesus Christ. We don't know that initially. And uh, we, even when you've been born again, you still don't know the fullness of God yet. There's a learning curve, I think, but you'll sure know something has changed. And uh, what a joy it is. It just gets better. It just keeps getting better. All right. Um, so she's requested, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw. I put a picture here just to sort of... Um, <laughs> uh, what he's offering is not a little sip of water from a well. It would be sort of like this waterfall here. There's so much more than you could possibly consume. But it starts by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's that picture is just simply a waterfall. <laughs> what I don't know how to picture 
the spirit of God that's being offered. But uh, it's a lot. It's more than, than we can grasp. So there is my effort to picture what's what he's offering. Well, the thirst quenched. This is a little summary of verses 11 through 15. During Jesus' conversation with this Samaritan woman, she's questioning him about the living water he was offering. And then Jesus explained that what he offered would eternally quench a person's thirst. And the woman asked Jesus to give her this water. This is not a Bible scholar. She's uh, a layman, uh, a lady with some some knowledge of a, a Messiah who's coming. But at this point, she's speaking with God in the flesh at a well. And on it's a, an ordinary day, it's probably a day she's, she's done this many, many times, come out to get water. But here is the Savior of all mankind, and he looks like an ordinary human being, a Jewish man, as a matter of fact. And he's, he's there, and he strikes up a conversation with her by asking her for a drink of water. There's, um, it, it's something that anybody could completely miss the importance of what's happening here. She's <laughs> confused that this man asked her for a drink of water. What he's there for and who he is has escaped her so far, but he's about to help her to come to a better understanding. That's the way it often is with Jesus. He's, um, he's so humble and meek. You may have a literal encounter with him and have no idea that you just met Jesus. This is her experience. She, she's going to understand here in a minute, but all through the encounters Jesus has with any people, look at how many people, number one, don't know who he is, and number two, are not willing to, um, to, re- to uh, uh, receive him. And there's a few, however, who do recognize him as the Son of God, and they are willing to receive him with all their hearts. To them, he gives the right to become children of God. So I can't, um, I can't fully explain how some people recognize him and some don't. Some perceive that he is the Son of God, like Nathaniel. Once Jesus said, uh, Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. <laughs> and Daniel says, Nathaniel says, you are the Son of God. Well, that's um, a gift that God gives to certain people. The Holy Spirit um opens their spiritual senses. But I think on the on the human side of this, there must be a willingness in each of us. And if we're simply willing, uh, honest about it, God will do that for us. He'll open our spiritual eyes and, and help us to see. So this is what we're studying. The uh, It's not just about well water. Um, let me move on here just to the next one here. Well, we have something to deal with here in this encounter. It's called sin. Sin is about to be exposed here. Now, notice Jesus is not um, trying to embarrass this lady. He's not trying to be judgmental. He's just bringing up a simple fact, and he does so by saying, Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. If I'm going to give you this living water, I want you to have your husband with you. Well, Jesus being omniscient, being God, he knows everything. He knows all about her already, but uh, she doesn't know who Jesus is. So he's going to give her a little preview of his omniscience. He's going to say some things to her that no one really should have known. She says, verse 17, I don't have a husband, she answered. Then Jesus follows up with, you have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said. In verse 18, for you've had five husbands, and the man you now have, number six here, is not your husband. What you have said is true. Can you imagine meeting a total stranger, and he suddenly reveals to you every relationship you've ever been in. He understands. He knows all about it. He could reveal as many details as he so desired, 
everything you and I have ever done is an open book to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, there is a book where there's a record of every every day we've lived. There's a there's a book in Scripture, and uh, in the book of Revelation, there's a reference to the books were opened and people were judged according to their deeds. So there's a, a record being made of, of what we do each day, and it must be a very comprehensive record. It includes our thought life. I say that because in the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he says if you've hated someone in your heart, that's equivalent to murder. If you've lusted in your heart for a woman, that's equivalent to adultery. So these things that take place in our hearts that we may think no one knows, God knows. God knows everything. Every thought you've ever had, God knows. He knows what you've done with those thoughts, and me too. I mean, this is inclusive for all mankind. He knows how many hairs we have on our heads. It's hard for us to grasp the the knowledge base that God has concerning us. So he's given her just a little sample, enough to surely get her attention. Um, I know, ma'am, that you've had five husbands, And the man you're living with now, uh, you're not legally married to him, so he's not your husband. But you've you've basically, uh, when you said you didn't have a husband, you were speaking the truth. Maybe not uh, being quite open, like not being fully transparent and open about it. But uh, she (laughs) she just said, I don't have a husband, which is true as far as it goes. She didn't reveal the full truth about her past, but Jesus already knew it. So I'm going to move to the next verse here, verse 19, John chapter 4, verse 19. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Now, let's change the subject here. Let's get off of my five husbands that I've had and the man I'm living with now. Let's talk about something else. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. She may be, now I don't know exactly what's going on in her heart, but I suspect that uh, she might be a little bit embarrassed or maybe convicted a little bit of, of her living relationships. And she's not really going to try to make a defense of it. She doesn't seem to want to speak more about, well, how did you know I've had five husbands or Uh, What she's gathered from this is that Jesus is a prophet, which is a correct assumption on her part. She's first met a Jewish man. She doesn't know too much about him. She's she's kind of uh, surprised that he would even speak to her or ask for water. And now she's perceiving him a little differently, which is a step up. She sees him. He is a prophet, one who has special information from God, one who's able to know things that other people would not know ordinarily. This is Jesus. He's a prophet. So she takes advantage of the opportunity to ask a prophet of God questions that she'd probably considered a long time. Where should we worship? Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, but you Jews, you say that the right place to worship is over in Jerusalem. So that's what she's She's going to go go for right here. Well, Jesus directed the woman to call her husband, to which she replied she had no husband. And then Jesus recounted her five marriages and noted that she's now living with a sixth man who was not her husband. So the woman redirected the conversation, focusing on the correct location for worship. Okay. Now, we'll move to the next um, topic here, which is true worship. Jesus told her, he's actually going to answer her question. He, notice he didn't make any further comments about her marriages, her uh, five previous marriages, or, or he didn't comment on the fact that she's living with a man. He just goes forward with the conversation, but he's, he said things, it, it was kind of subtle, He just asked her to go find your husband. He didn't condemn her, but he brought out some things which he already knew, and he let her know 
that he knew these things about her. You know, that was my experience when I first met Jesus. Suddenly, I knew he knew everything about me. And I, I can't explain how I had that awareness, <clears throat> but I can tell you what it was like. It was as if he was standing in front of me, and then he walks around behind me. And then we start this movie in front of me. It's like I'm looking at this um, gigantic movie screen, and I'm seeing me in my life all the way back to when I was just a little kid, and I'm seeing myself move forward through life, committing various sins. Uh, The circumstances were very explicit, everything he showed me. And uh, for the first time, I don't know if you've ever heard of someone drowning and they survive and then they say, I saw my life flash before my eyes and covered a lot of time in a very, I mean, a a long life in a short period of time. Well, I had something like that. It was um, a clear overview of my life uh, from the time, I think the earliest thing, I was probably about three years old, all the way up to age 42. And I saw many different things I that I had been doing, sinful things, uh, my, my whole life, all kinds of things that I didn't want anybody to know anything about, things that I hope nobody knew anything about. And here Jesus is showing me, I know everything, everything, every, every place you've ever been, every person you've ever been with, what you did with those people, all of it. He knew it all, what I'd thought about, what I'd looked at, where I'd been, and he knows every detail about you as well. He just happened to show me enough of my past to really get my attention. When someone knows you that well, that intimately, uh, how do they know that? Who are they? Well, only God here in this case, he was able to reveal that to this woman. He could have revealed everything about her, but uh, we have a record that he revealed this this little bit of information, but it was sufficient to her to identify him as a prophet of God. It will have a profound effect on you when he reveals your past to you. He'll do it now, uh, so just uh, pray and ask him to show you whatever uh, he's seen that, that might be pertinent that will help you. He can reveal things specifically to you uh, that will help you to see who you are and who he is. And that's, that's what he's doing with this woman. This is what she needed to hear. So he's, he's given her this bit of information concerning her prior life. And, uh, now (laughs) she knows he's a prophet. All right. He's much more than a prophet, but he certainly is a prophet here. So he's going to continue with the conversation. He's addressing this, uh, question she's posed about where should we worship? And Jesus told her, Believe me. Oh my goodness, what a statement. Believe me. That's what he asks of all of us. Believe me, woman. An hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. Uh, We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. Like I said, the Samaritans really only used uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy for their scripture, but the Jews had the full canon from uh, Genesis all the way through Malachi, the full canon of the Old Testament. And then there's Jesus, who himself is a Jew. His uh, mother is Mary. Um, His uh, ancestor there through through Mary's genealogy was... um, King David and uh, Abraham uh, way back there. So as Jewish as you can get, he was a Jew coming to the Jewish people. He was the one who had given their prophets the writings they had. But she's deduced that so far. And um, he's, he's making a statement here. When you will, you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. It's not the physical location that matters. It's in your heart worship him in spirit. Let's go on here to the next verse. Um, He's going to explain it further. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers 
will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Okay. Um, this, uh, this is true worship. To worship God from, from the bottom of your heart, it's sincere and as genuine as it gets. You absolutely adore Jesus Christ. You love him. Uh, you don't understand everything there is to know about him. You, you haven't seen him with your eyes, but uh, you love him and you want to be with him and you trust him implicitly. All these things that the gospel writers are telling us about him, they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit, and somehow you perceive these things are true. This is uh, how you worship God in spirit. And then the writings in the, in the gospels and those of the Apostle Paul and John and Peter, the, uh, the New Testament authors have given us the truth, and the Old Testament author, authors have, have done the same. They've, we, it's all true. So we're, we're worshiping according to the truth contained in the Holy Scriptures, and the Holy Spirit bears witness to us that these things are true, and we follow, and um, we mean it from the bottom of our heart. We love him, and it turns out he's enabled us to do so by uh, indwelling us through his own spirit, and we're able to enjoy a oneness, a fellowship with God. Let them be one as we are one, was what Jesus is going to pray in John 17. So true worship, um, it's like a true relationship. If you've um, uh, ever been in a relationship and you really thought you knew someone and then uh, something happened, you came to a point where you realize they're really not who I thought they were. They not, weren't completely honest with me. They betrayed me. Uh, they lied to me or lied about me or something to that effect. You've you've come to a much deeper understanding of who you were in this relationship with, and it and it didn't work out like you thought because they weren't who you thought they were. Well, it's with Jesus here. Once you know who he is, you can give yourself unreservedly to him wholeheartedly because he is good. He is perfect. He is God, and he's trustworthy. There's no one else on earth that's trustworthy in that manner like Jesus. So uh, the Father wants us to recognize him and then give ourselves wholeheartedly to him. An hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, Jesus declared that the debate about the location of the worship was actually irrelevant. In this new hour, worshipers would approach God in spirit and truth, independent of any specific location. Well, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. Now when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Look at this verse 26. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. You couldn't get a clearer um, uh, statement from Christ Jesus concerning his identity. I am he. Uh, and she's been referring to the Messiah, the Christ. Jesus is saying, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am he. I'm the one. All right. Well, <laughs> she's about to move into her city. She's apparently quite persuaded that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. She runs to town. She tells everybody there, could this be the Messiah? I think I found him. Come and see. So she brings the town people, townspeople back. How much knowledge does someone need to believe in Jesus and to be saved? Really, how much do you need to know? When the woman mentioned the Messiah, Jesus just plainly identified himself as that person. He is the Messiah. He was the one she had been anticipating. And so um, she's ready to worship him with 
uh, genuine uh, affection, genuine love. Uh, that's in spirit and in truth. And uh, since God himself is unseen and yet active, she's going to worship him in the uh, from the unseen part of her, her spirit. And uh, these are essential. She's going to worship according to God's will by receiving God the Son. Okay, we'll move over to that. Um, true faith now. The woman acknowledged that when the Messiah came, he would explain everything, and, and that's true. And Jesus then proclaimed that she was speaking to the Messiah. This is much better, I'm sure, than she's imagined. She's, um, she's met the Messiah, and, uh, you know, I think women sometimes are intuitive, but in this case, this is a work of the Holy Spirit. She's able to understand Jesus is the Messiah because the Holy Spirit's at work in this. She's face-to-face with God the Son. God the Holy Spirit's at work in this entire um, setting. In her heart, Jesus is speaking directly to her. He's certainly full of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to her. And uh, her life has changed. She's, She's being born again. And then you can see it. She runs off into the city, brings the townspeople back, and they, uh, Jesus stays with them a few more days. And then later they say, well, at first we believed you're the Messiah because of her testimony. But now we believe because we have met you for ourselves. And folks, that's the objective here. All people need to meet Jesus for themselves. Literally receive him by faith in spirit and in truth is the only acceptable worship that God the Father will receive. And when we, um, when we come to Jesus, like this woman, she didn't go to seminary, it doesn't look like. She, she's not a theologian or a, a Bible scholar. She's just met Jesus and uh, accepts him as the Messiah that he is, the Christ, and then she runs to tell people, pretty good, pretty good sign she believes him. She's running to town to tell everyone, and they come and basically agree with her, this is the Messiah. And we believe ourselves. So she and her town basically received eternal life. Well, in summary, Jesus provides uh, eternal satisfaction and eternal life for all who trust in him. And people find lasting spiritual satisfaction only in Jesus. Folks, billions of dollars won't do for you what Jesus Christ can do. The entire world, what would it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and yet lose his soul. Uh, The implication there is you've lost everything when you lose your soul. And the whole world is nothing compared to the value of your soul. Well, people find lasting spiritual satisfaction only in Jesus. And admitting our sin is really the first step toward salvation. And believers must worship God in spirit and truth. And believers find eternal satisfaction through faith in the promised Messiah. Well, I could go on for hours. I've talked long enough. I want to thank you so much. Subscribe, make comments. Please pray for me. And may God richly, richly bless you. I'm going to pray us out here. Father, I just pray that you'll bless the hearers. Everyone who watches this or listens to this or any portion of it, I pray that you'll be at work deep in their hearts through your spirit, reveal Christ Jesus to them, and then help us all respond in the same way this Samaritan woman responded. Help us to be soundly convinced that you are the Messiah, and then help us to run and tell everybody we know. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.